Bob and Susan Bailey as we do evangelism together and you know, work with the children. I want to thank Carl up there and his assistant and his helper uh, for the beautiful sound that they've been supplying to this church. I'll tell you, there's bones of speakers on the events. I'll throw all my trash away in my bones and, uh, <laughs> and just pray don't strip them off your church and take them with you. They're beautiful, aren't they? Well, of course, it's my church too. I'm a member here, so I don't want to take them. <laughs> At home, we're going to be here listening to that beautiful, beautiful uh, music. <clears throat> Grace, the two covenants of God. A uh, little girl was sitting in her grandfather's lap. Grandfather was reading her a bedtime story. And every once in a while, grandfather noticed that uh, she would put her hand up and touch his cheek, but he also noticed that she would touch her cheek with the other hand. This went on almost for the entire story. And our grandfather was watching. And finally, uh, little Missy said, uh, Grandpa, uh, did God make you? And uh, Grandpa said, yes. Missy, God made me a long time ago. Oh, she said, well, uh, did, did God make me? And Grandpa said, yes, Missy, God made you too, not so long ago. And reaching up and touching his face one more time, and then touching her own, she said, he's getting better at it, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> a cute little story. But some people take this fantastic subject, the two covenants, and try to make a little fuzzy out of it. And uh, is the word covenant just a nice sounding religious word? No. Uh, I was sitting in a restaurant uh, with Baptist minister Norman Bickle in Kissimmee, Florida, and we were talking about the two covenants. He said, you know, Brother Jack, I'm so glad that I'm not under the old covenant like the Seventh-day Adventists are. Attempting to keep that old Mosaic law, the law of Moses, uh, trying to keep the Sabbath uh, like Moses gave to the people. I said, well, that's a pretty interesting observation, Pastor Nickel. Um, but the question is, let me ask you a couple of questions now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if we had a glass of uh, grace, is that glass of grace half full of grace and half full of works? Or does grace make up for our lack of works? Uh, how do you see grace and works working together? This is very important to understand in order to understand uh, the new covenant. And he looked at me and he said, well, I, I, I suppose uh, that whatever we cannot do, that God would make up the difference. And so I said, okay, so you're telling me that this glass would be somewhat full of works and then somewhat full of grace. Is that what you're trying to tell me? He said, no, because I don't even believe in works. He said, I believe that it's all grace. But, but I said, why not the Bible? We're, we're to be zealous of good works. And that grace would bring that upon us. I said, Mr. Bickle, I said, the thing is, by the way, uh, Norman Bickle was the uh, associate evangelist for Billy Graham. And he was coming out to hear me preach each and every night. And we spent time together. Now, I have to say, we also spend time playing golf together. See, Baptist preachers are great golfers. And so, uh, when you have that, they're great preachers as well. I've often said that. H haven't I said that, Brother EJ? Okay. Uh, but anyway, we did spend four or five games playing golf together. And in the end, the poor man said that every time we got up to the green, you had another angle on the Sabbath. And um, he said, and finally, you talked about the Sabbath as it relates to the new covenant. The conversation in the restaurant was that in God's glass is all grace filled right to the top. He's Amen. full of grace and full Amen. of truth. Jesus is. And to have grace, you have to have Jesus. And to be some of some good works, we have to have Jesus. Jesus in us, the hope of glory. God's grace automatically fills us up with good works. 
As we walk with Jesus, we walk with him in spirit and in truth. As we walk with Jesus, we begin to see the relationship between obedience and grace and how it works together. The love of God and how works and love work together. In fact, it's always been that way. God had told uh, Noah that uh, Noah was to build an ark. And God had seen in Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Titus 2.11, the Bible says that all men who are saved, are saved by grace. The grace of God has appeared to all men, all the way back in the beginning. We see grace in the Garden of Eden. But grace is not the new covenant. It never was the new covenant. Uh, the scripture was read today by the warriors, what the uh, grace is, what grace is all about, and what the covenant is all about. The covenants are God writing in our hearts His laws and His ways. But grace is the vehicle, the vehicle of the two covenants. The new covenant is not grace. Grace is the power of the new covenant. But the new covenant is something that is written. The covenant uh, that has always been with us. It's a matter of obeying God. The very first problem in this world was disobedience to God. So it's not about words. It's about obedience. It's about obedience to God. Love for God and God's love brings that obedience upon us. In fact, uh, in Israel's day, and I turn to Exodus chapter 24, uh, we read in uh, uh, verse 7, And he took the book of the covenant and read the audience of the people, verse 7 of Exodus 24. Okay. And they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the book of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. All right. Were they obedient? No. Were they obedient? No. Absolutely not. No, they were not obedient. Moses no sooner went up to receive the, the law of God written on stone. And he came back down off the mountain. He found them dancing before the the golden calf. In anger, Moses threw those commandments down that had been written by the finger of God and crashed them on the side of the mountain. And he said, you have forsaken the covenant. You have broken the covenant. God had come down on Sinai and prove you whether you would sin or not. So the old covenant lasted 40 days and 40 nights. That was it. It was broken. Never again would God call his people to make promises. You know, uh, it took me a while in my ministry, but I finally got to a place where I do not require people to come and make promises before the Lord before they are baptized. Because our promises are like empty uh, ropes or like sand, empty sand that just shifts. For instance, let me give you an illustration. Let's say I'm finishing up an evangelistic campaign and there are a number of people ready to be baptized. Now I think it's fine to review what some of the Adventists believe. But oftentimes I would ask people to covenant or, or to answer yes or no uh, to the questions. And so we have them standing up here in baptismal robes and uh, we start asking them questions. Do you? Will you? Will you, will you believe? Will you uh, accept? Uh, do you promise to faithfully? Okay. I know. Let's take a look at the situations here that we're, we're describing. We have um, um, uh, Sally Sabbath Breaker standing here. <laughs> and over here we have Smoking Sam standing in that line. And so we go through the principles of what we believe, the, the 13 articles of the 28 uh, that uh, really highlight what Seventh-day Adventists believe. And the whole congregation is sitting out there watching, and these new people are standing here, and they're making a covenant with God in front of this church. A covenant between themselves and God. By the way, a covenant is a two-party contract. God has said, and then the response to what God has said, 
we will do. Just like Israel did. All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient and it was ratified by the blood of bulls and goats. And uh, it was in the book of the covenant and the book was sprinkled and the people were sprinkled. That put the book of the covenant together with the people. But it wasn't just a few days later they had forgotten that promise. Now they're worshiping the golden calf. So Sally, Sabbath breaker, gets baptized and uh, Smoky Sam gets baptized. They, they walk out, they shake hands, they give them flowers, uh, <clears throat> the little gifts that we give them, and they walk out the door. About Wednesday, Smoky Sam is eating a cigarette very bad. His nicotine nerves are jumping all over the place. And then the boss comes and says, to make sure this happens, by the way. The supervisor comes and he says, Sam, you are really doing a terrible job. The poor guy's nervous. He's trying to overcome his smoking. And, you know, not everything is just clicking exactly right because he had been smoking for a number of years. And uh, he's having a nicotine high and nicotine low. And so uh, he's now being discouraged by some comments from the supervisor. So he goes into the smoking room and somebody says, Sam, Satan is right there. Sam, have a cigarette. Get your hand down, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Smell your breath. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark Finley tells a story where he was holding a, um, a little worship at church school. And he said, Now, how many have prayer requests? The little boy put his hand up. He said, Pray for my daddy. He's an elder in the church and he smokes. <laughs> That's not you, Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So Smoky Sam gets discouraged and he lights up a cigarette. And as he's smoking that cigarette, he's thinking, Oh man, I'm a backslider. It's only Wednesday. And I stood before the Lord and all those beautiful, sinless people at the Seventh day Adventist church. Uh oh. Those high standard people. Now here's the problem that we have. We Seventh-day Adventists have the highest standards among churchmen in the entire world. We really do. The problem is we're not all hitting those standards, right? We don't hit on all six cylinders or eight cylinders. But those people don't know it. Because you see, they're all cleansed. They're all washed and clean. While well, we wait for the foot washing the following 13 weeks for our re cleansing. And so they go out, and uh, poor Smokey Sam says, I can't go back to those people anymore because I broke my promise. Look at this, I'm smoking a cigarette already. So we, 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 we find out that the evangelist has baptized people, and they went out the back door, and, and uh, the pastor gets all the blame because they didn't come back. That's a good arrangement. Let's talk about Sally Sabbath prayer. Folks, I have seen this time and time and time again in my preaching career. That company may not have worked a half a day Saturday for 40 years, but as soon as Sally Sabbath prayer gets baptized, the devil lands a nice big contract in his company. We've got to work six days a week now, half a day Saturday, everybody. Sally, we need you in here. And she says, but I just got back, Sally. We want you here. And Sally's thinking about paying for the car. She's thinking about paying for the mortgage on the house. And, and uh, this, that, the other. And so she, she, she's a brand new Seventh-day Adventist Christian. So she, she gives in and she works on Saturday. And as she's working, she's thinking, oh, man, I promise. All that the Lord has said, I will do and be obedient. And so she says, oh, what's the use? What's the use? Yeah. This is exactly why we have the galaxy groups. So the people can find out that the rest of us have problems too. So that when Stokey Sam breaks down and he, he smokes having a, a, a nicotine fit, He's thinking, I've got friends back there that can pray for me. 
I'm in a group that I'm, I'm getting close to, and, and uh, uh, this is just a, another hurdle. This, this is another growth that I need in my Christian life. And Sally Sabbath writer said, oh, I remember, I remember people there saying they had a problem this way too. And, and uh, but those are my people back there because they're praying for me. And, and my people back there have problems just like I have. Maybe not the exact same problem, but we all sin and come short of the glory of God and that's why we have the covenants. And when we understand the covenants, it makes all the difference in the world. And by the way, Moses uh, did not conjure up the Sabbath day. No. He simply reiterated what God had been saying all along. In fact, God tells him uh, in the next chapters of Exodus to bring those stones you you out. He said, two tables like the first and bring them up to me. And I will write on them according to the first commandments I had written. And we read in God Deuteronomy chapter 10 that the commandments are the covenants of God. Amen. But this time, Moses doesn't exact a promise from the people. He says, look, you have made your promises. God has broken his contract with you because you broke your contract with him. Therefore, I'm going to put the commandments this time in the ark under the mercy seat. You're not, I'm not going to break them on the side of that because you're just, you're, 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 you're rebellious people, he said. But the God is full of mercy. He had just told me so on the mountain. He's a merciful God. He's, he, he loves you. And therefore, he has given you another opportunity. He's willing to make a new covenant. And when I told Dr. Norman Bickle that God made the new covenant way back there on Mount Sinai, and I showed him why he made that covenant, because the commandment says uh, in Jeremiah chapter 31 concerning those covenants, I will write my laws in your heart. I will be to you a God who shall be to me a people. It's found also in Hebrews 8 chapter. And everywhere we find the new covenant written, we find it written to the house of Judah and the house of Israel, not to the Gentile world. Because God wants us to become spiritual Israelites. This time he tells us, you put the commandments and safekeeping in my ark. And those who love me will come toward my ark just as surely as those who love God back in the days of Noah had the opportunity to go to that ark. Now all of us couldn't get into a wooden structure like uh, they had an opportunity to do in the days of Moses, of Noah rather, but we could get into that ark with Jesus by faith. So the new covenant then must be built upon the principles of faith. Open your Bible with me, please, uh, to... Uh, Romans, the book of Romans. One of my favorite books. Luther was 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 uh, filled uh, with with this wonderful uh, idea. Now here we discover in Romans the fifth chapter. By the way, it was the book of Romans that that encouraged and changed the heart and the theology of Martin Luther. The Bible says in Romans five verse one. Therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The new covenant ought to bring peace. Amen. It's about obedience. It's about, it's about uh, lots of things. And you notice what it says, uh, verse 2, For whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice and hope, and the glory of the glory of God. Not only so, but we have... Uh, glory and tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. And patience experience, experience hope. And hope makes not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when uh, we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8, for God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Isn't that wonderful? God, God's telling us through this wonderful experience. See, God's making a contract with us. He says, look, if you will allow me to write my laws into your hearts, he said, I will be to you a God, and you shall be to me a people. I will make a contract that way. 
When Moses put the law in the ark, and the ark was safely placed in the most holy place behind the veil, okay, it would remain there behind that veil until Jesus would die on the cross. He even said so. As he handed the cup to his disciples, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Ratified by the precious blood of Jesus, it would stay in safekeeping for many, many centuries until Jesus would die over that broken law himself. And that's called grace. Grace is the power of the new covenant. It should make us joyful and happy inside. Don't you think so? Okay. What station does the law of God have? In the book of Romans, we also discover uh, that the law simply points out our sins. It's like looking into a mirror and reading the book of James, chapter 1. Uh, the law of God, the law of liberty, is like a mirror. And so we look at ourselves. Oh, no, not again, Jack. You already looked at yourself this morning. Okay. i got to see you every day. Man, man behind the glass is a good poem written about that. Okay, anyway, <clears throat> you got to guard your conscience, that is. Okay, so the, the, the mirror of the God's law only points out what sin is. When a person tells you you're no longer under the law because you're under grace, there's a big problem with that. Uh, if the way that it's meant today, that we don't need to worry about the law of God uh, because we're under grace. Well, let me say, if... Um, if I'm under grace, then I can now bow down to idols, or I can uh, steal, or I can tell lies, or I can cut. Okay? You couldn't find a preacher in the world, I don't believe, that would say you could do those things. At least he wouldn't say them out loud to people. But you see, using the new covenant to maneuver around the Sabbath is uh, usually the order of the day among modern preachers. And among people. Is that so? Is that possible? Well, let's just carry that a little bit further. Let's just say a man comes up to me and says, Look, Brother Jack, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus because you've convinced me that God is full of grace and truth. Jesus, he's full of grace and truth. The law came to us by Moses, but Jesus brought to us love, mercy, and grace. So therefore, I'm no longer uh, obligated to keep the law of God. So what would you think of me if I would say to such a person, uh, well, that's true, you're under grace. Yes, you see, uh, I make my living picking, picking pockets at human law. And there are some good ones out there that know how to pick pockets. I know the police doesn't like it too much, and the people get angry when they discover that their money's gone, but... Uh, other than that, I'm under grace. What would you expect me as a pastor to tell a person that it picks pockets for his living? Well, it's okay. I mean, you've got to work half a day Saturday. Uh, and you're under under grace. You don't need to worry about uh, this. Or 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 you're, you're a pickpocket. So uh, as long as you're making a living picking pockets, you're under grace. I think God would kind of put it like that. Does that make sense? Absolutely not. Listen. The whole juggling act here is between obedience and the grace of God. And how do the two come together? How do they come together? Contractually, the new covenant is a contract between man and God. And what God is trying to do through the new covenant is to restore us back into the image of Adam in his pre-fallen condition. The whole process of the Bible, if we read it carefully, is just that. God bringing us back at London with Him, like Adam and Eve were before the fall. Amen. The word atonement is used, but broken down, uh, broken down, the contraction, atonement, is at one minute with God. And so He gave us a wonderful covenant contract. But does the contract change between the new and the old? Question. John, let's just suppose you, you've got a house that's worth $500,000. You and Sharon live in a nice home, uh, $500,000, and you decide to sell it to Esther and myself. You didn't know we had that much money. And I didn't know your house cost that much. But anyway, we're having fun here today. Um, and so he has it for sale, and I agree to buy it. And don't yell sold. Okay. 
And so, <clears throat> we make a contract. You show us the house, you show us the desk in the kitchen, you show myself the garage. Uh, men like the garage for some reason, you know. Um, and and uh, we go all through the house. We see the living room, the bedrooms. Uh, we look upstairs, we look downstairs. And we decide, yes, we'd like to buy your house. So you get the papers out, we sign the papers. We even go to a notary republic and, and we ratify the deal. It's notarized. And then we go away, we, we watch John and Sharon's house. A day or two later, I called you, John, and I said, John, you know what uh, Esther and I were thinking? And you can tell by the sound of my voice that we're not going to buy your house. So you just cut to the chase and say, uh, Brother Jack, you're not going to buy our house, are you? As well, John, uh, we found something else that we like a little bit better. We backed away from the contract. You didn't back away. You owned the house. You didn't back away. We backed away. We did not perform our agreement with you. Now, let me ask you a question. Has anything changed with the house? No. Are the same shutters on the house, the same porch, the same garage, the same kitchen, the same, yeah. same carpet, the same thing? God said that you broke my covenant. Therefore, I'm not obligated uh, to perform the promises of the covenant that I promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Then God told Moses, I have God of mercy. I, I, I am merciful God. Showing mercy against iniquity. So therefore, I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Has so anything changed with the house? The, the, the commandment of God? Absolutely not. But something changes in our relationship to it under the new covenant. And our relationship to it is, is that the relationship is strengthened in Jesus Christ. And we, and we now know that we cannot do these things on our own. And so, uh, uh, Sally Seven Prayer and Smoking Sam out there, once they covenanted uh, to, to, to be with God and to uh, love Him and to be baptized in Him, can now go forward and say, That is correct. Under pressure, I smoked a cigarette. But I got a God who's willing to keep that covenant with me because of Jesus. Amen. It's not about me breaking over and smoking a cigarette. It's about Jesus dying for me smoking a cigarette. And, and for Sally, it's about Jesus dying because I would break over and do what wasn't right. And anyway, this begins to soak in over and over and over again. The love for Jesus becomes so strong that we want to uh, begin to follow him. And so we go to our support group, our, our galaxy, or to our friends that we base. Who pray for me here. I, I know you missed me on Saturday because I broke down and went to work. The boss said I had to come in. Let, let's pray again. Right. I want to tell you something. A very astute young minister helped my father. But my father lost his job at DuPont. Not too long after World War II when jobs were scarce. My father just bought a brand new, or built a brand new house that was mortgaged. And uh, uh, there were three of us children growing up. And uh, the, the uh, organization of DuPont told my father, either you come in on Saturday or you won't keep your job. And uh, my father uh, was a brand new Seventh-day Adventist, had just been baptized. I'm telling you folks, Satan works against the covenant of God. Amen. And you can count on it. This is not um, uh, Tom Fuller we're talking about here. This covenant is, is a real thing. And I was a little guy, but I peeped out uh, at the pastor, young Tommy Green, the intern pastor, was on his knees with his arms around my father's shoulders, and they were praying. My mother was kneeling there as well. And they were praying. My father had teared his eyes, Lord, what shall we do? And Pastor Tommy Green had teared his eyes, Oh God, give Roy strength. This is a test giving strength. Amen. 
Well, my father didn't win that Saturday. He was in church instead, singing hymns and listening to the, to the preaching and was sitting there with his family, all three of his children. And according to his own story, but then the following Monday, they said, Lord, we're going to put you down to sick this past Saturday. But you can't be sick next Saturday. And my father went to church again the following Saturday. He went in on the following Monday, and they had his basement ready and said, You're done, you're fired. But it was the support of prayers. It, was, it took me two years to stop smoking, by the way, after his baptism. He'd sneak out behind the garage, my mother went to see. <laughs> but my mother had a sniff of the <laughs> bar none. But eventually God gave him that victory too. Amen. You see, here's the beautiful thing about the covenants. It's not about us and our failures, it's about Jesus and his successes. Amen. The Bible clearly says he overcame sin. He, he did not sin. So therefore, we can trust our case to him. Most gladly then would I trust my case to him. Now, if you turn with me now to the book of Hebrews. Oh, Hebrews is such a wonderful book. It talks about the, um, about the covenants. It talks about how the covenants interchange. It talks about the contract basis. It talks about the inheritance coming after uh, men are dead. It talks about uh, your will and testament. But I'm going to read this to you uh, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 20. Here's the good news. Here's the good news about everything we're talking about here today. It says, now the God of peace, 13 verse 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. How was Jesus brought forth? And the great resurrection through what? Come on, folks, through what? Do you realize there's so much power in the love of Jesus that it brought him out of the dead? Amen. Amen. That's what it says to you. Read it with me carefully. That great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant brought Jesus from the dead. There's power in the blood. Remember that old song? There's power. So for, for, for um, uh, smoking Sam or, or Sabbath breaking Sally, there's power in the blood of Jesus. If you've got a problem with telling the truth, there's power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. If you have a problem with evil thinking, sexual thoughts, there's power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have a problem uh, with, with taking time to study the Bible and to pray, there's power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. We need to learn to put holy habits in our lives when we do that. That is Bible study, prayer, uh, attendance at religious meetings, and, and uh, uh, meditations on the things of God. There's power in the blood of Jesus. So powerful, it brought again the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Look what he goes on to say. It's beautiful. He says, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, comma, verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, it's about Jesus. It's not about my failures. What he's telling us here under the new covenant is to look away from self. Look away from self and your own failure. If you look at yourself and your own failures, you become... What you find here from God is Jesus holding out God the Father through His Son through the power of Christ's blood, holding out the olive branch of peace to us. In other words, God, long ago, um, um, saw as a foregone conclusion that we are desperately wicked. That we needed help to be saved. Amen. That's right. 
He concluded us, the Bible says, under sin. And so he said, a new covenant will I make with the house of Israel, but the house of Judah. says, I will circumcise your hearts. When we read that Romans 3, 28, 29, I will circumcise your hearts. Take away the stony heart. Make room to write my laws and my commandments in your hearts. I will do that. <coughs> and I will be to you a God, and you shall be to me a people. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that warm and fuzzy sounding? I will be to you a God, and you shall be to me a people. My dear friends, the new covenant is not getting out of anything. The new covenant is coming into something. Let's get the preposition right. Not out of the way from, but into. Into this glorious spectrum of the presence of God. And we, we need to raise our hands up and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For what you've done. Not only did you die, and shed your holy blood. But that holy blood brought you again from the dead that I might have eternal life. Amen. Not only eternal life in the future, but the power of Christ's blood can help me when I walk through this life. Amen. Praise God. In fact, not just help me, it molds me and shapes me. Amen. You know what it's about? Think it's about. It's about getting up under the arm of Jesus and standing there every single day. It's not about using Jesus when you need him because you're having a smoking nicotine fit. It's not about needing Jesus because you're having trouble keeping the Sabbath or, or um, being kind to your family. It's not about using Jesus, pulling him out of this corner when you need him. It's about being with Jesus as part of your life. About letting him live inside you day by day. That is the power of the covenant. Amen. I'll tell you, folks. I discovered that when we accept the covenant and take his olive branch in peace, I discovered, I discovered that walking with him becomes a joy. Amen. Amen. And something you look forward to. And doing the things that Jesus did, helping the poor around me. By the way, that's, uh, if I was going to put it, if I was going to rank it on a list of things to do, it's most important. Did you know, did you know that taking care of the poor and needy around us is over top the Sabbath. <laughs> if you don't believe it, read it in Isaiah 58. Read it in Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus said about the Sabbath and other people. This man, this woman, this woman, isn't she more important than the Sabbath? Wasn't the Sabbath made for this woman? Isn't she a child of Abraham? Amen. That's what the covenant does. The covenant gives us the proper priority. The new covenant puts us in a holy relationship with God. For he says, be holy, even as I am holy. So the new covenant doesn't release us out of. It brings us into a higher and more noble standard. Amen. And those who embrace the new covenant of Jesus, they begin to look like Jesus. Things happen. Let me close with a little story. He was the Apostle John. You remember John when he was a young man, John and Peter? You remember reading about those, those, those guys in the Bible when Jesus called them out of the fishing boat? Peter, James, and John were very close to Jesus because somehow they were one of the first disciples. And not only that, but they were the most ambitious. And that really turned Jesus off. He really enjoyed uh, these, these apostles, just in John. He had a real, uh, a, a real something special with John. <clears throat> but John uh, was called one of the sons of thunder. You know why? Uh, they were walking into Samaria one day, and John said, uh, Jesus, they won't let us walk through. Uh, Let's call a fire down from heaven. We know what to do with the fire, Lord. Let's just burn them all up in there. You've got power. You raised the dead. We see you uh, doing many things, making bread for thousands of people. Um, call some fire down. Lord, shall we call fire down upon them? And Jesus said, Fire? Fire? What are you talking about? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I burn them up. Tells us something about Jesus, right? 
James and John, by the way, had another problem. One day they, they got to the public. See, they were real cool guys. They didn't want to go straight away and ask uh, Jesus to do this, you know. But they asked uh, their mother to go up and talk to Jesus about when he, when he was due to receive his kingdom. That uh, they can, can my son James sit on one side and can my son John sit on the other side? The other disciples started to grumble. And he had a grumbling bunch <laughs> for three and a half years. <laughs> Going into that city of Samaria, uh, into the city of Capernaum, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe just kicked a little bit of dirt with his hands. Jesus was really human. I really enjoy him being fully human and fully God, don't you? We can really relate to him, praise God. I can see him there kicking a little bit of dust. And uh, finally, <clears throat> uh, James John, give me a minute. Now, what were you guys talking about along the way as we were traveling toward the city? <clears throat> well, it's a nice day today, isn't it, Jesus? <laughs> Jesus said, Jesus said, the lords of the Gentiles seek the high places. But the Son of Man has come to serve. What pathos was in the voice of Jesus? We knew this from the spirit of prophecy, by the way. You see, Lucifer was cast out of heaven because he wanted a high place. Come in the high place. What am I talking about? Let's fast forward to the Isle of Patmos. John is an old man, about 90 some years old. And he's still in the first century. Jesus had died, he rose again, he ascended to heaven. John saw all of his brethren martyred and murdered. And now we find him sitting on the Isle of Patmos. He's an old man. He's an old man. The book of Revelation has been completed. Now he's working on the epistles of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. There's a white beard. Those little smiling wrinkles under his eyes. And he writes, God is love. Amen. And he who loves God loves one another. Amen. But John, John, you've changed. I changed, he said. Yes, John, you've changed. Why, you Samaritans, and now you're telling God is love, and, 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 and we should love one another. John, what happened to you? What happened to me? Me? Yes, John. You're talking just like Jesus now. Amen. rising higher and higher into the lightness of Jesus are the last ones to know it. Do you realize? They're the last people in the world to know it. They still see themselves as filthy rags like we really are. Yes. But the longer you're with Jesus, the more like you can become. Yes, amen. The more like His words you sound. The more like his actions, you really uh, do. Until your whole life is perfumed with the holiness of Jesus. Then our Heavenly Father says, He that is holy, let him be holy still. Amen. But he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. 
Yes. I know Brother Bob should be further along in his Christian experience. He probably can say the same thing about me. But where I am in my Christian experience is God's business. Not his business, not your business, not even my own business. Except as it relates to his business. Amen. It took God a long time to bring John to where he was. God is love. Amen. God is love. We must love one another, even as God has loved us. Amen. It took John a long time to get there. But getting us there is his business. And that, that is what the new covenant is all about. Amen. Heavenly Father.